SpaceX just blew up a Raptor version 3 engine at the McGregor test site. And while that sounds chaotic, even reckless, it's actually the opposite. This explosion is a deliberate move in a much larger strategy. A strategy built around Starship, the rocket that could rewrite the rules of spaceflight. Because if there's one message hidden inside that fireball, it's this. 2026 is shaping up to be Starship's breakout year. The year SpaceX finally puts all the work, all the testing, and all the painful lessons of 2025 to the test. And at the center of that effort is Raptor 3, the engine designed to push Starship harder, higher, and farther than ever before. Mid-November, during a routine run at SpaceX's McGregor test site, a Raptor 3 erupted into pieces the moment engineers tried to start it. Seeing an engine explode on a test stand grabs attention, but in the story of rocket development, an explosion can also be a useful piece of evidence. What made this event unusual was when it happened. The failure occurred during startup, not after a long-duration static fire like many past incidents. Startup is the most delicate moment in an engine's life. Thermals, pumps, and igniters all must come into alignment in a fraction of a second. If any element is off, a part that's still warm when it should be cryogenic, a turbo pump that spins too slowly or too fast, or a pre-burner that lights out of sequence, the whole system can self-destruct in an instant. There are two simple ways to read this test. One. It was an unlucky, isolated fault in a single unit. 2. SpaceX pushed the engine deliberately, stressing systems to find the limits. Given SpaceX's long history of provocative, high-stress testing to expose failure modes early, the second interpretation fits the pattern. Find the edge now, fix it before flight. That's why an onstage explosion can be progress, not just drama. Each failure narrows the list of unknowns. It points engineers to specific subsystems to inspect, instrument, and redesign. In short, a dramatic event at McGregor didn't mean mission failure. It meant data. And data is the raw material of reliability. If the McGregor test was a stress check, it's easy to see why. Raptor 3 isn't an isolated upgrade. It's one piece of a much larger plan to make Starship operational engineers aren't tuning an engine for its own sake. They're tuning a propulsion family that will power Block 3 hardware and, if schedules hold, push Starship into an action-packed 2026 Raptor 3 is being framed as more than raw thrust. Yes, the goal is huge. Engineers expect the engine to reach on the order of 300 tons of force, possibly closer to 330 tons down the line, which would put it among the most powerful single-chamber liquid rocket engines ever built. But the leap isn't only about power. SpaceX appears to have trimmed mass at the same time. Raptor 3 reportedly sheds over a ton compared with Raptor 2, multiply that saving by 33 engines on a super-heavy booster, and you're looking at a weight reduction measured in tens of tons, Mass that can be traded for payload, margin, or more performance, the calendar matters. Raptor 3 is slated to show up in early 2026, with Flight 12 marked as a key milestone, an in-space relight of a Raptor 3. Relighting a vacuum-optimized engine after prolonged operation is one of the hardest real-world checks a propulsion system faces. Past flights have sometimes struggled with reignition after long burns, Proving it in flight is what turns bench data into mission capability. So the upgrade is both tactical and strategic. More thrust, less weight, and a step toward engines that can be reliably restarted in flight. Those three things together change how a vehicle is flown, recovered, and reused. A cluster of Raptor 3s won't just add thrust, it will act like Starship's throttleable, steerable heart. By throttling and vectoring groups of engines, the upper stage gains precise control through thick air and thin. That control is exactly what SpaceX will need when it tries a far harder trick next year, 
bringing Starship back from orbit and catching it on the launch tower. We've watched Super Heavy practice the tower catch already. Catching a booster in mid-air is impressive. Catching an object returning from orbital velocity is a different class of difficulty. The vehicle returns hotter, faster, and with much tighter margins for timing and control. Engine cluster steering becomes critical. Small thrust differences change where the ship points and where it will meet the catcher arms, SpaceX plans to attempt that orbital catch in the first half of 2026. The rehearsal value is obvious. Every relight, every throttle, every marginal correction on the test stand or in a suborbital run teaches engineers how to manage the full orbital return. Reusability has a clear financial upside. Fewer built-for-one flights, lower cost per launch, and a faster cadence. But money isn't the only constraint. For near-term, high-priority missions such as NASA's Artemis III, SpaceX, and mission planners prefer simpler, lower-risk choices. Expendable tankers or landers that compensate the complexity of large-scale in-orbit refueling, Starship is enormous, and that comes with a harsh penalty. Almost all of its launch mass is propellant. By the time the vehicle climbs to roughly 400 kilometers, about 250 miles, it has already burned nearly everything it carried to get that far. At that point, the rocket is effectively hungry. It has the structure and engines, but not the fuel to push a payload further or to slow down for a safe return. The solution is simple in concept and fiendish in practice. Launch a second starship as a depot, rendezvous in low Earth orbit, dock, and transfer cryogenic propellant. The pair behave like an orbital gas station, comparable to how military planes refuel in flight, but colder and heavier. Both vehicles must meet precisely, seal a connection, and move methane and liquid oxygen through plumbing while keeping the propellant super cold. Small errors in timing, attitude, or plumbing pressure can spoil the burn, so practice is everything. SpaceX has targeted a demonstration of this capability in June 2026. The test uses a target starship placed in orbit, followed weeks later by a chaser that docks and performs propellant transfer using pressure differentials. Success here turns laboratory plumbing and test stand numbers into a working, repeatable operation. The difference between a clever idea and an operational architecture. If Starship can prove that it can refuel in orbit next year, the path to its next milestones becomes far clearer. The first major checkpoint is scheduled for June 2027, an uncrewed Starship landing on the lunar surface. Roughly a year later, in September 2028, the same architecture is planned to support a crewed lunar landing the moment Artemis transitions from concept to reality. But while the world focuses on the moon, another plan will quietly begin taking shape in the background. Mars. SpaceX intends to launch up to five uncrewed Starship version 3 vehicles to Mars during the 2026 window in November and December. These early missions won't carry humans, They'll carry sensors, tools, and a handful of Optimus humanoid robots built by Tesla. Their job is simple. Explore, collect data, and perform small tasks that build confidence in landing techniques, surface operations, and resource use. Musk himself has joked that an image of Optimus walking on Martian soil would be epic. The challenge is timing. Reaching the 2026 launch window depends entirely on mastering orbital refueling, the same hurdle that stands before every long-distance Starship mission. Musk rates the odds at about 50-50. If they manage it, the company will escalate quickly. Between 2028 and 2029, the plan expands dramatically. Roughly 20 Starships heading for Mars some potentially carrying people. The strategy is flexible and cautious where it needs to be. If the first uncrewed landings perform well, humans could fly on the following opportunity, 
If not, SpaceX may choose to repeat one or two Optimus-only missions before committing crew. We'll see, Musk says, a reminder that even the most ambitious plans hinge on technical realities, not just timelines. SpaceX has already begun the quiet business of picking a place for the first permanent settlement. The criteria are straightforward. Stay away from the cold poles, find shallow, easily reachable water ice, and pick terrain that's flat enough for safe landings and launches. Right now, the favorite is Arcadia Planitia, a broad volcanic plain in the planet's northern hemisphere that checks those boxes, according to Musk, the numbers that follow read like a planner's fever dream. Slides shown by Musk sketch a stepped buildup. Roughly 100 ships in the 2030 to 31 launch window, then as many as 500 in the 2033 window. The end goal is a self-sustaining city, one that could survive even if contact with Earth were severed. That city, in Musk's vision, would host more than a million people and require moving millions of tons of cargo across interplanetary space. To reach that scale, SpaceX imagines scaled-up starships, eventually a fully stacked vehicle some 142 meters tall, and a cadence of launches unlike anything in history. At maturity, Musk suggests, thousands of ship upper stages could be arriving and departing each launch window, building out habitats, mines, and infrastructure. It's an astonishing plan, part logistics, part vision. And it ends with Musk's blunt call to action. All right, let's get it done. Next, we'll look at the practical challenges of turning that vision into a functioning city. Life support, power, and how a human society might actually grow on Mars. To live on Mars, people need air to breathe, water to drink, and food to eat, just like on Earth. But Mars doesn't have enough air or liquid water, so we have to create special systems to recycle air and water and grow food indoors. People will also need energy to power their homes and machines. Solar panels can collect sunlight, but Mars has dust storms sometimes, so nuclear power plants might be used to make sure there's always electricity. Building houses and places to work is important too. Some homes might be underground or inside special domes to protect from Mars's harsh weather and radiation robots will help build things before people arrive. Of course, mental health is also a matter. People need ways to stay healthy, learn, and have fun. Growing a city means making schools, hospitals, and places to live safely, while slowly expanding by using stuff found on Mars 